Welcome to Converting to Dats and Sops. Here we're going to take a closer look at just these two families and how we can better understand how they work. Let's go ahead and start by adding a pattern chop here into our network. Now it's not uncommon when working in Touch Center that we want to have a closer look at the data inside of one of our operators. So for example, our pattern chop here, and let's turn the link down to say just 10. We have multiple samples stored inside of this channel, and we can kind of see where they are. In fact, if we make our operator viewer active, we can right click and select the dots per sample. And now we have a better way of seeing where our actual samples are, but it's still hard to understand the value of those samples. Let's right click on the output of our pattern chop, head over to dat and select a chop to dat. The chop to dat is going to give us a column for every channel that's inside of our channel operator. And we can see that in each row, we have the values of our samples. We might better see that here if we head over to the channel page at a second channel. So I'm going to call this Chan2. And now we have two channels. Now these are both the same values right now. So we might offset these here on the phase parameter. Let's use a little expression and we can use me.chan index divided by me.numchans numchans. Now we can see that we have different values stored in the samples for these two channels. And this is great, but one problem I have here is that I don't actually know which one of these channels my columns correspond to. So on our chop to debt, let's go ahead and turn on this include names parameter. This will put the names of our channels here as the header for our chop to. Now this is great. This organizes our channels into columns where each row is a new sample. But this might not be the way that I actually want to use my information. And in fact, we could swap this to be output as a row per channel. When we're output as a row per channel, here we see now that we have a new row for every channel that's inside of our channel operators and each column corresponds to a sample. This is one way that we can convert the data from something in say, a channel operator into DATS, but that's not the only way that we might want to think about conversion. And in fact, let's head back over to our surface operators this time, and let's add a circle SOP here to our network. I'm going to turn the number of divisions on our circle SOP down to say six. And when looking at our circle SOP, we might actually want to have some more information. Now it's difficult for us to see here the actual data for where our points exist. We could make our Surface Operator Viewer active, we could right click inside of this, we could select Display Options, and we could turn on our XYZ coordinates, and this would be one way to actually see that data. But this isn't particularly useful for me if I actually need to extract this and work with it inside of, say, operators. So let's take a look at how we might do that. I'm going to right click in the output of my circle SOP, head over to DATS, and select a SOP to DAT. Now here in my SOP2 dat, I now have a view like a spreadsheet of each of my points and their data. We can see here that I have an index that tells me which point I'm working with. And we can see that our attributes are broken into columns. So for example, our attribute P or point has three different attributes for X, Y, and Z. And these are broken into individual columns. Now, what could I do with this and how might I use it? Well, let's say that what I actually want to do is I want to modify just, for example, this point at index zero. Let's connect our circle SOP to a DAT2 SOP. And let's go ahead and add a table DAT here into our network. Now, in our table DAT, we're going to make a few changes. First, let's go ahead and make it viewer active. Let's uh, start by adding a header for index because we need to identify which index we want to modify. I'm going to right click on the header and select add after. And in this case, I only want to add, uh, modify the TX position, which is P0 as an attribute. So I'll input P0. This is the attribute I want to modify. And I'm going to add one row below. Now I'm going to specify that I want to modify the point at index zero. And let's push that point all the way up to say two. Now I'm going to make uh, my table dat non-viewer active. I'm going to turn that off for a moment. I'm going to drag that on top of my dat too. And now what we'll see here is that we've modified just this point at index zero. And in fact, we could turn that up or turn that down. I could make it to maybe 1.5. If I wanted to change which one of the points I was modifying, I could change the index I was pointing to. So I could say even point to index one.
If I wanted to modify another point, I could add another row here. And in this case, maybe I want to modify index zero and I want to push that up to two. And this is a way that we could specify which point exactly we want to modify uh, inside of a surface operator. This is a pretty interesting way that we can work with SOPs. And it uses this idea of converting both to DAT so we can see a little bit more of that data and how we can then convert that information from DAT back into SOPs. Now, there's another interesting example we might take a look at, and that's working with materials and how attributes work there. So let's start again by adding a pattern chop to our network. With a pattern chop added to our network, let's add a line SOP to our network. And I want to make sure the number of samples and the number of points in this line match. Here on my pattern, I'm going to go ahead and grab the length parameter. I'm going to drag that over. I'm going to hover on top of my line SOP until my parameter window shows up. I'm gonna bring that over here and then I'm gonna release the mouse here on the parameter I wanna target. I'm gonna select bind. This is gonna make sure that I can make changes in either location, either on the pattern chop or on the line SOP to change the other one. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this down to a number of points of 200 for now. Now I'm gonna right click on the output of my line SOP. I'm gonna head over to components and I'm gonna grab a geometry component just so we can set this up. Now, while we're here, I'm also going to add a line material. I'll add that to my network and I'll apply the line material here to my geometry component. I'm going to right click on the output of my pattern chop and I'm going to add a null for now. So we can just go ahead and add this here because I'm planning ahead just a little bit. I'm going to scoot this over. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to use this curve to describe the width of my line. And in fact, there's a few ways that we could do that. But one of the interesting ways we can do is to take advantage of what's here on our line material, where we can actually affect the line width. So let's go ahead and add a chop to SOP here after our line. Now we see there's an error. That's okay. We haven't assigned a chop yet. So we actually need to take these values here on our pattern and apply them here to our chop, our chop to SOP. Here on our pattern, let's change the name of this. I'm going to change this to width so it's better described. I'm going to take this null SOP. I'm going to drag it on top of my CHOP2 SOP, and I'm going to drop it right here on the CHOP parameter. I'm going to specify that I actually want to apply this to width, and I'm going to uh, specifically name the width attribute as the attribute that I'd like to apply this to. Now we can see here there's a little bit of a change, which is great. We're getting close. On our pattern, let's go ahead on the pattern page and let's turn up the amplitude to say 100. Now we can see that we've applied our width change here to what's happening with the width of our line. Now we do have a slightly interesting behavior. So what we're seeing here is that there's no actual negative values to how we might represent width. So instead, our negative values become positive values. What we do have here, which is really nice, is we go from 0 up to 100, down to 0, and then we go from 0 to negative 100, which is really 100. A better way for us to visualize and understand mathematically what's happening here is let's scoot over our operators a little bit. Let's insert a math chop. And with our math chop, if we then, on our uh, channel pre operation, select positive, this is a better way to really understand what's happening in terms of how this is being rendered. Let's make a few other changes while we're here. On our pattern chop, let's go ahead and turn our taper down to zero. And let's turn our number of cycles up to two. So now we have this really fun way of seeing that uh, pattern as applied to the width parameter of our, or the width attribute of our geometry. The last thing we might do here is animate this. So let's add a quick expression. We're going to do abs time dot frame. And let's go ahead and actually let's do ab time dot seconds and multiply that by say 0 0.125. Now we do have an interesting behavior here over whoops, on the left hand side, which is we can see that we're kind of exploding out here. And what we might change here on our line material is to head over to the line page and make sure that our starting cap isn't set to round, but is instead set to none. Excellent. There are lots of ways that we can think about converting between operators. And these are some of the essential operations that we need to think about when we're working with different operator families and touch designers.